Welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally. If you missed our last episode with our entrepreneurship teacher for K-5, through Mello Foster, please go back and check it out. Our guest today is both an educator and business owner. He says he can address the theoretical academic aspects of a topic and the actual implementation aspects as a practitioner. He has an MBA in business, management, marketing, and related supported services. This is both impressive and a mouthful. He teaches <laughs> business and economics at Penn State Scranton. Please welcome to the Teachers Pep Rally, our guest, Frank Sorokach. Yay, Frank. Yay. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me today. So it's great to be with you and looking forward to discussing education and entrepreneurship. It's a great combination. So yes, let's do it. And it's something that all of us uh, really enjoy and love because we are both educators and entrepreneurs as well. And this podcast is living proof of that, right? So this is a very mm-hmm. entrepreneurial endeavor. So you're, you're actually living what we're talking about. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Frank. So I'm curious because I just went through a very impressive, even just a little snapshot of it, <laughs> of your resume. So what, and, it, and it's very heavy business oriented. So what was your journey into teaching? What got you into teaching it? Yeah. So I started out uh, teaching in the corporate realm. So in the 1990s, I was working for the American Red Cross Blood Services, and they were going through a consent decree at the time with the FDA, and they had to make a lot of changes. And so they created a position that was unpaid. It was an education position Uh, called a preceptor. And so they looked for people throughout the organization. I was a marketing person at the American Red Cross. And I said, well, you know, let's try seeing if I can help people with uh, learning whatever procedures they had to roll out. So that was really kind of my first foray into into teaching. And then as I did that, uh, and I moved on and moved into technology after marketing, anytime we rolled out uh, new technology, components within the organization I was working at, uh, there was always training involved. And so I, I realized that I liked training. It's kind of a weird story. I, I, I do a lot of corporate training even today as well. And I teach goal setting. And so I have a kind of real quick goal setting story, which shows the importance to goal setting. So mm. somewhere around 1999, I said, yeah, I'd really like to teach. And I was looking around at, at the local colleges, had a discussion with someone and someone said, hey, you should contact this person at this college. And I said, I'm going to write that name down. And I put it in my to-do list. And to-do list sometimes, you know, you never get to stuff. And a year later, someone comes up to me, a different person, and says, hey, this person over at the college, at this college, is looking to bring someone in to teach computer networking. I was in technology at the time. And I said, that name's familiar. I went back and looked at the mm. to-do list. And that was the name I put on the to-do list. I called the person up. They said, you're exactly what we need and started teaching in 2001 at the uh, at the college level. And from there, it just kind of, you know, got out of control. So that's <laughs> how I got into teaching at the collegiate level. Uh, so uh, goal setting matters. Right. So mm-hmm. I know this is not a goal setting session, but there's a lot of goal setting in in entrepreneurship as well. So um, write those goals down and do your best to follow through on them. So mm-hmm. anyway, it's awesome. That's Absolutely. the, that's the it path. Sound, it sounds like the universe or something was really trying to get you to teach. Things. That's the <laughs> lesson I took from that. You um, know, it's, so there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of nuance in the world, right? There's a lot of nuance in life. And if we look for things, we can find it, right? Mm. So it's a matter of keeping our eyes open, knowing what we want. The biggest problem we have as, as humans, we just don't know what we want sometimes. And that's really another component to entrepreneurship, which I'm sure we'll get into is, kind of knowing what you like to do. And I'll, mm. I'll share some share some stories about how people really don't know themselves that well. Mm. And that creates a lot of uncertainty in terms of where they want to go. So at any rate, uh, there's uh, you're right about the universe speaking to people, right? Man, I could go, you guys, I could go in so many directions. I'm trying to figure out which, <laughs> which one I want. Um, yeah. I'm going to... I'm going to throw a Disney reference. So there's a couple, several of us that are big Disney fans. Um, I think a lot of it because he, Walt Disney was, I would say, an entrepreneur and he took amazing risks. So even at a young age, just hearing about seeing what he did, I've always been fascinated with that. Um, and so there's a story of, uh, I don't know which park it is, Peter Fred, it might've been the Disneyland. He wrote on a napkin, kind of the map of his idea roughly 
of what he was thinking about doing before it came. So talk about goal setting or having a vision. And so yeah. when I started doing all this side stuff before the podcast, I st- wrote out what I wanted to do for teachers. And I started planning out what my entrepreneur goals or vision were. And even though I d- couldn't see how I could get to some of the things like doing a podcast, hello, T- TPR, um, I put it on that napkin, so to speak. And here I am doing one of those things that I put on there. And I just sometimes have to stop and think about that plateau I was on, but I, I set goals and I'm, I'm making them, right? I'm making mm-hmm. them. So that's so cool. Yeah. And, and the written word is so critical. So writing it down makes all the difference. And I, mm-hmm. that's so metaphysical. And a lot of people don't want to adhere to they, they say, well, you can't prove that, but there's enough anecdotal evidence from people that teach that those types of things. So Fred, I apologize for cutting you off. No, no, not at all. I just, you know, just to chime in with all this, 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 this topic here, um, I just got done reading green lights by Matthew McConaughey and, mm. and I loved, I, I, it was an audio book. So, but I got to hear him read it in his voice. And it just was, I think a huge difference, which is funny, but the addendum at the end is him reflecting on his top 10 list that he created in 1999. Wow. And in 1999, he said, I'm going to win an Academy award. And then, Lo and behold, 10 years later, he, he won an Academy Award. Um, and it's just a great, he goes down the whole list and it's like, wow. He, he And he added that in, especially now during COVID. I guess he added that piece in there. So yeah, everything you're saying, I think, yeah, it's, something, it's just a great reminder for all of us. It's corny, right? So people are like, ah, you know, it's kind of goofy. If someone sees it, I might look odd. And, and so there's a lot of reasons that, that people don't do it. But, you know, for anyone watching, I think that that's a great piece of advice. Just, just write stuff down and and, you know, Disney, you're right, was great for a lot of entrepreneurial things. I just saw, I think, an ad the other day. Uh, so on ABC, it's the 50th anniversary, I think, of um, Walt, Walt Disney, Disney World. World. Yep. Walt Disney World. Oh, yeah. Walt, Walt Disney World. And so when he wanted to do Disneyland, ABC wanted to do a show and he didn't really want to do that show. And he ends up doing the show to get the money to start Disneyland. And there's <laughs> another entrepreneurial lesson, right, where you're where you can take what you do in one area and leverage that for another area. So yeah, you're right. Disney has a lot of great entrepreneurial stories yeah. associated with him and his brother and the organization. Yes. That's where I totally, totally nerd out. <laughs> there we go. Let's nerd out. There we go. Yay. We're nerding out about entrepreneurship. Hey, hump, day, hump day nerding. And so, and so I guess in, in full disclosure too, Frank and I work together closely in an entrepreneurial uh, component with Penn State's okay. launch box which is a ideation and business planning mechanism vehicle that, that aids and assists people. So everything he's about to bring forward, he's also living proof of, I could speak that much because of his background not beyond the education piece. So it's cool stuff we're going to talk about. Yeah, I'm very excited. And I had mentioned that. So our episode before this one, we talked to a teacher who taught entrepreneurship to kindergarten through fifth grade. And so that was really interesting to, to hear about that. And we even mentioned like Shark Tank and you see some of these young kids come on with really innovative, creative ideas and, and, and great, um, I would say, strategic plans. So I'm curious when we get to the uh, young adults or even adults who decide that this is something they want to get into and, and pursue on the college level, what are some things that you want them to understand if they're going to pursue, let's say, a degree in business, whether it's an entrepreneur side or not? Yeah, so I, I really do believe, so I teach business courses and I really do believe that uh, it's a powerful degree in a lot of ways. It's so in most universities, most institutions, the most um, attended degree, the most pursued degree is the business degree. So the business degree is kind of a catch all. And so in some ways it, it gets a, a bad reputation because, you know, the person who can't do anything else ends up in business. Uh, so, so sometimes people kind of poo poo that, that idea of doing a business degree, but um you know, I said this to a student the other day, uh, we were going through a topic and they were kind of like, eh, you know, I don't know if I agree. And, and I said to them, well, what do you want to do? I want to be an attorney. And I said, well, do you want to own your own firm? Yeah, I want to own my own firm. Then these business concepts are critical, right? So here's okay. someone who's going to go to law school. They don't really care about business, but yeah, you do care about business, right? So, you know, even if it's a minor, so if you're attending a university, a college, even if it's just a few business courses, but I like completion. I think completion is an important thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So if you get that minor, if you don't want to do business, that's cool. But usually you can get a minor. If you're pursuing a bachelor's degree, usually for about, 
15 to 20 additional credits, typically about 18 credits, you can get a minor at, at many institutions and that will kind of shore up that background. So it's one way. Of course, you know, the school of hard knocks is another. Sometimes it's just best to go and do it and learn it. So that's the other way. And there's nothing wrong with that as well. So it, it's, I don't know that there's a single path. Um, is it okay to kind of dive into the entrepreneurship at the collegiate level? You want, Please. You good yes. with this? Yeah. So, so uh, Fred mentioned the launch box. And I want to talk about this for a minute because I think it's really important. And it's where a lot of institutions are going. And if someone's out there listening to this and they're in an institution that's not, they really should be thinking in these terms. So the launch box is about a five-year-old concept at Penn State University. Uh, it's kind of the brainchild of our, our president, who's Eric Barron. So he came up with this idea to kind of create an environment that fosters entrepreneurship at the local level. So there are almost 20 campuses throughout the state of Pennsylvania. And what they've done is they've tied one of these facilities, one of these launch boxes at every campus. So uh, they're not necessarily on the campus, but they're close to the campus. They branded them differently. So they're not branded as Penn State. You would not know it's a Penn State uh, institution that you're entering. The, the colors are orange and white, so it's not new. Yeah. <laughs> so you have no idea. And and it doesn't matter. And, and that's the way that the institution wants it. They, they want it separate from the institution. They want it separate from Penn State because they don't want someone to say, well, geez, I went to you know UCLA and I happen to live in uh, Philadelphia and there's a launch box and they're not going to want me there. So so it's meant to be independent of the institution. Uh, I attended a conference about two years ago, just before the pandemic. And what I found is this is happening all over the country. So when you think about a university, it's this behemoth of, a, of an institution. It's got all these resources. And quite honestly, historically, universities have done a really poor job of uh, in what we'd call engaged scholarship. Engaged scholarship is you come in, you're a student, but you do stuff to learn, right? So uh, now they're learning that we, we really have to change our mindset. We've really got to provide opportunities that allow students to learn in an engaged way by doing. And so these things are popping up all over the country. And typically they don't, you don't have to have any involvement. Sometimes you have to be a student at that institution. Penn State, we don't care. If you, if you have a, an idea and you want to come in and just talk about it, great. Uh -huh. uh, so I think that's something to look for if you have entrepreneurs out in the audience that are looking, even if it's a, a grade school person, a grade school kid who wants to do something, they can go to the local, local college, say, hey, do you have any kind of incubation services? And what do they cost? They should be free. Can you help me? Right. So mm -hmm. it's it's for anybody. And that's um, a cool trend that's happening now uh, across the United States. And of course, as one does it and then another and another, everybody realizes, OK, we have to do this. But it's really a great social benefit that we'll see probably over the next five to 10 years everywhere. And you'll just walk in and they'll help you. So that's something that young entrepreneurs should look for in an institution. Do they have that kind of entrepreneurial bent and, and that, that they're willing to help people? If I could just tag on to that too, one of the things that allowed the launch box we're associated with to, to succeed was where it was placed. So we are not at the university. We are actually in the city and we are in a place where we um, get, a, we're in a high traffic area but it's also designated to serve underserved, underprivileged women minorities. And that's how we got our initial infusion of uh, money to kind of grow and build it out. Um, and now it's just a matter of kind of like Frank said, kind of bringing that, kind of cultivating that. And that's where I think Mello's talk last time kind of sets the stage for that. It starts to plant the seed, Frank, really, really early to consider entrepreneurship because we see them sometimes too often where they're already baked, as I like to say, and they the entrepreneurship thing is like, no, 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 no. I'm looking for the nine to five job, you know, the nine to five uh, gig. And I, I don't need to be doing the hustle thing, but, but we have to understand, like, I think that's what was happening in this country is that has to be considered in, in your paths. Now um, you got to be a little bit more nimble. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Leticia. Yeah. Leticia, so go I, was, ahead. I was, I was just going to mention that this first of all, conversation is so rich already. <laughs> and like Aaron, I can just go in a million ways, but the, the, the point that's really sticking out to me that I love is that I wish that educators, those traditional routes, if you will, would, ex, would, would even consider um, 
diversifying their education, right? Like teachers go this specific route if they want to be a school leader, right? Teacher, school counselor, assistant principal, like there's this cut kind of cookie cutter path. And then they get to become a principal. And Aaron, you can attest to this. They become a principal and have no concept that education is a billion dollar business. So they don't have any, they don't like as a recruiter, you know, in my past life, trying to teach them how to market their school, you know, I mean, just all of that, the, the, the managing people or human That's resource key. management, right? Principals, educators that want to lead buildings don't have that skill set. And now as an entrepreneur myself, I'm like, okay, I'm 51. Do I want an MBA? Because that's pretty scary. (laughs) But I actually am welcoming the opportunity to learn because I think to your point, business is so important. MBA can really help you in every field. And I just wish that education, you know, that the curriculum was more robust or that even a path for that, right? Like if part of your leader, if you want to be a school leader, well, then why don't you minor in, in business? I mean, I don't know how that would work, right? No, you're right. In higher ed, but I just think di- diversifying your, your, your degrees, I think is just critical. hundred percent. And I'm also thinking marketing. We don't have people in school buildings or in districts and maybe even in universities that really, we have communication <laughs> departments, but sometimes they're pretty antiquated in education. Um, and we don't think about kind of moving the needle and becoming modernized uh, quick enough, I think. And so marketing is a huge part of reaching into your community, reaching to your stakeholders. And I would even say, and, and Frank, maybe you can back me up. So it's funny, this week, I am at the University of Georgia taking a, just a kind of an added on continue education class. And it's uh, strategic decision making and crisis management. Mm. Oh, wow. Right. It's business oriented. However, it's this mindset that I think I'm looking at being a leader in the district. What are things that I need to kind of consider and, and learn Absolutely. that maybe I didn't learn as becoming, you know, a, an educator? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, and this is true in any field. Right. So at one time, see, historically, you've got depth of knowledge and, and breadth of knowledge. Right. So historically, we've been taught that you need depth of knowledge to be successful. And that is true historically, right? So if you were going to be a school administrator in the past, yeah, it was about understanding education. It was about understanding the business of education. And maybe that's still true in that field. But as you move out into industry, especially as you move into different businesses, the more general you are, the more likely you are to survive, right? So if we just take Mm -hmm. this from a survival standpoint, do I have enough skills that if my job ends today, and we've seen this in the pandemic, Mm -hmm. right? Everything is mass chaos. So if my job ends today, is there another skill that I can fall back on somewhere else to to survive? And I think that, you know, I don't know if this is a a good name or a bad name to bring up on this podcast, but Elon (laughs) Musk, right? Ooh, Mm -hmm. that's good. Some people like him, some people hate him. But he's the ultimate entrepreneur. You know, when he wanted to start, um, you know, a space company, Mm -hmm. you know, he went out and learned. He's the senior engineer, right? He got an engineering book that that wasn't his background. He gets a space engineering book. I'm, you know, speaking kind of figuratively here, but not so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he learned how to become a space engineer to run a space company. Right. And so he travels to Russia to look at their, you know, at that point, their programs falling apart, but this is, you know, going back 20 years. Um, And, and so, you know, Elon is a great example of someone who's just got mad skills all over the place. Right. So it's really kind of a, a great model to look at. And there's one other thing about Elon that I think is a great lesson as we think about this kind of having more breadth of knowledge versus depth of knowledge. Uh, And there was an article I read a few weeks ago, maybe two or three months ago. uh, And and basically the the premise of the article was this, Elon considers everything a side gig. So Mm. if you ask Elon, what do you do? Like today he might tell you, I run... SpaceX and tomorrow I run this and that, you know, he's got uh, whatever the, what's the company that's doing the implants. Um, Oh, I can't think of what the name of the company is. I just, 
side yesterday. And whatever. So whatever the cyber implants are, you know, he's the CEO of that company. Depends on the day, but he looks he I looks at it. Tesla as oh, a side gig. The Neuralink. Neuralink. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Neuralink. These are all side gigs to him. So that's a really important takeaway, I think, for anybody that's watching this. Even your my, even your main job is a side gig, right? Right. Look at <laughs> everything you do as a, as side, a side gig. gig. And you'll never be left out to dry, right? You'll never be in a position where, oh, shoot, like everything I knew my whole life has disappeared. Right. So I think it's a real good takeaway for people to, to, to think about as they're thinking about potentially taking on entrepreneurial endeavors. And I think young people are just naturally good at that. They're like, why am I going to peg myself into this one corner? Yes. Uh, I could do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, they see it on YouTube every day. They see it on TikTok every day, right? They're seeing it. So they're much more inclined, I think. Whereas those of us that have been around a while, we say, well, you know, I do what I do. And so I don't know if I can venture into something different. Right. I love that you're saying this, Frank, <laughs> because <Thank you. laughs> uh, many, many years ago, and, and maybe uh, you guys remember here in Georgia when we had uh, the furloughs and all this, the economy, all that was happening. Well, prior to that, I, you know, in thinking of where would I get my, my next degree, I went a completely different route to become a therapist. And so when that hit, I was not as stressed as my colleagues, because I knew that as a a bilingual therapist, I could get a job anywhere, (laughs) right? Like that I had a skill set that most people didn't have, right? In education, this diverse skill set, which Erin, I'm glad to hear that you're diversifying. Um, And it's so important. That's the message that I want our listeners to hear, because I just think that teachers are, for the most part, naturally entrepreneurial in nature, we will, I mean, quickly create a program. We will create worksheets and lesson plans yeah. and put all our intellectual property, you know, right. into a, a staff development, not thinking sure. that someone will away. pay you for that and give it away, yeah. which that, I don't do anymore, Frank. Yeah. That, that, that's <laughs> I good. am like not giving it away. <laughs> that's, good. that's good. And look, it, and in today's world, right? So everything is IP. Nobody masters that better than Disney, right? Everything about Disney is intellectual property. It's their intellectual property company and, and they, they are masterful at managing it. And what's great is as entrepreneurs, you can look to those types of organizations right. and say, what do they do? How do they manage their portfolio, right? And so you're exactly right. So if you're creating those forms, you can save them as a PDF, stick them up on a website and let people have them, right? And maybe... Maybe you don't make any money on that, but you might build a reputation on that. Correct. Then you put some YouTube videos out there. You monetize that, right? There are many ways to monetize. There's not one path. Um, but I love what you said about you know being bilingual, having multiple skills. Like you felt kind of invincible, right? Even mm-hmm. in a recession, right? You're like right. I'm invincible <laughs> because if this job yeah. and I can follow over on that. And, right. And so. Absolutely. And that's kind of what, you know, and, and Aaron said risk earlier today, you know, earlier in our show. And that's the kind of thing that I kind of, I want to spark for our audience, right. Is to take the risk because I did, I took that risk. And then they said, go to central office and become a recruiter, start a program, had no knowledge of any of that. Right. And so now I have the HR kind of business side. And now it's, it's, I mean, it's just so wonderful waking up in the morning, knowing that I have so many places to pull and I, and I want our teachers to feel empowered and encouraged to do that. People are scared of imposter syndrome, right? So someone might find out, I don't know what I'm doing. Elon Musk didn't know how to build a rocket 20 years ago, right? (laughs) You learn by doing. And so Mm -hmm. Every time I want to master a new topic, so so I'm doing a talk in about a month on work from home. I've been doing this over the last year, a couple of talks on it, but I'm putting it out there. I'm going to do it to, uh, for our local chamber, for the Scranton Chamber of Commerce, we're going to, for local executives and business owners, we're going to do a work from home um, seminar, like a two hour seminar. Mm -hmm. And I've done some of these talks at different, uh, at different points in the past. I've kind of been building the material up. And I'm just going to take it to a new level. No one's done this before. I don't think anybody's done it before. I could fail miserably. But if all you think about is the failure, you will never try anything. Right. 
And what I found in doing this approach to things is you just try it, you find out what works, you find out what doesn't. Most of the time, people don't even remember the things that don't work well, but when something does, Mm -hmm. they're like, wow, it's a great piece of information, a great topic, whatever. Absolutely. Pete, you had a thought, go ahead. Pete, yeah, so uh, I wish this launch pad (laughs) was launching when I was in my schooling years because, oh my gosh, the pivots that I had to do, I have a small theater company, and the pivots that I had to do in this last year to survive mm. um, were quite, quite daunting. And I'm, I was always second guessing. And I, you know, I, I've been learning, you know, school of hard knocks way. Um, if I was in your area and I walked in my first visit and I walk into the, 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 the building, I say, hey, I have an idea. Can you talk me through the process? What do you guys say and do to somebody who's walking in for the first time with an idea? And so they don't get scared and walk out. I mean, what do you guys do to get them, get it, capture them in, bring them in? Mm -hmm. This is a great question. And so I'm going to give you my favorite story, which is arguably the, 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 the least amount of win that you could get in a scenario, but felt the best. Like, so, so from a raw number standpoint, so here's what every institution wants to be able to do today. Every institution that does this type of endeavor wants to be able to say, we created jobs. I mean, there is a, right, a certain right. amount of like, you know, what's in it for me as an institution right. to dedicate these resources. Economic impact. That's, that's economic all, impact. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And so, and so, you know, some endeavors aren't going to create any jobs. Right. So I had a woman come in and uh, very impoverished. She didn't have anything. So to kind of walk through the scenario, Pete, basically I sat there and I said, well, what do you like to do? That's usually my first question, whether it's a, a someone who's deciding where they want to go to college, what they want to major in, or someone who wants to start a business. I always ask them, what do you like to do? Because that's really the key is what do you like to do? We hear that and a so lot. Mm-hmm. She had all these ideas. Like I want to do this. I want to do that. And it came down to, she, I think she was really good at cooking and she was really good at making candles. I think it was. And so you know, I said, well, geez, opening a restaurant, that's a big endeavor. You have to have a lot of money. She did not have the resources to do that. And then we got into this candle thing. And I said, candles, interesting. I said, you make the candles yourself. Yeah. And she pulls out like five samples. And I'm like, this is really an interesting uh, Mm -hmm. scenario. And I said, do you have a little bit of inventory? Yeah. I have like 20 of these built up or whatever. Okay, great. I said, hold on. And so the facility that we're at uh, in Scranton is in, it's part of a facility from another nonprofit. And that nonprofit helps underserved people in the community. Uh, it's, it's, it's a largely uh, immigrant population, immigrant minority population in this area. Uh, and, but they have a farmer's market. And so I said to this woman, hold on, let me go check something. I go next door to the person who runs the farmer's market in this community. And I said to her, um, how do you get a table at the farmer's market? Um, well, they're free. They're free. Okay, <laughs> great. So I said, I got a woman next door who would love to have a table at the farmer's market, go back next door, bring the woman back over. And, you know, I don't know, that's already, that's pre COVID. It's two years ago. Who knows what happened? You know, so we never really had the chance to follow up with her because of COVID. We, we try to when we can, but you know, it was the lowest stakes win, if you will. Mm -hmm. But for that person, it was the biggest possible breakthrough. And so, you know, so it could be that small in scale. Uh, We've had people that wanted to open up uh, distribution centers come in, and that's way beyond our scope. So it's, it's Fred, and it's uh, John, another person who we work with, and myself, basically, who sit and talk to people uh, that have business ideas. And when they don't, what we've gotten very good at doing is we've, we've really established strong relationships with everyone in, uh, in Northeastern Pennsylvania, in the Scranton area, that is somebody who's in economic development. And so now when someone comes in, so Pete, if you wanted to give me your idea again, what was your, you wanted to do what? Oh, geez. When I grow up, what do I want to do? <laughs> Pick anything obscure. I, I, I have a theater company. I have a, a theater small, company. We, we support arts programs in schools. Okay. Yep. So you have a theater company. So what we would do is we would look at the different entities that we work with and we would say, all right, we're not equipped to help. We don't, you know, you don't want me acting in your show. So that's not going to work out too well. <laughs> but, but who can we find 
that that has resources. So there are economic development resources that uh, will help you build a facility. There are some that will help you hire people. There are some that will help you with intellectual property. And so we would find the best resource and basically be a conduit to that resource. Uh, that's what we found to be our niche, if you will. Now, if you go to Hazleton, which is about, oh, about an hour from Scranton, an hour south of Scranton, uh, they have a, a very large minority. So, so, so Scranton's uh, population overall doesn't have a large minority population, but this segment of where our launch boxes in Scranton happens to have a large minority population. But when you go to Hazleton, the whole city has a very, very large minority population. So they've plugged into that minority population. And, you know, we, if we have an event, we might get, you know, five people at the event. They have an event because, um, you know, because of the inroads that they've made, they get 40 people at an event that'll come in and talk about their business and, you know, the things they want to accomplish. So what's kind of cool about the model that Penn State has, has developed is as you go to different areas, that launch box kind of reflects on that area. For Scranton, we found the best way to do that, Pete, would be to say, all right, you really seem like you pair up well with this economic, the Scranton Chamber of Commerce is the right area for you. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some resources that we can get you to. And then we do a warm handoff. We do a warm introduction from you to someone at the Scranton Chamber of Commerce or Ben Franklin, who is an institution that works with uh, organizations that, that want to manufacture. So we would find the right the right organization. Mm -hmm. um, but the first sit down or two might just be 30 minutes of, Pete, tell me what you do. And mm -hmm. so we try to get a feel for what you're doing. Um, a lot of the time it's just advice and that's all, what people want. You know, what direction should I take? The biggest question we probably get or the most common question is, should I incorporate? Mm -hmm. You know, what, how, how do, do I need an accountant? It's really basic kind of stuff that people want that initial, uh, that initial assistance with. So, yeah, I, and, and, and just to tag on to that too. So, uh, cause I work a little bit on the, while well, I'm, I'm on the tech side, we have a student that's going to be coming in here. Uh, I don't know, Frank, if you saw the email the other day, but he approached me and he, and he said, Mr. Fred, I have an app idea. And in that I said, so, okay, well, let's just kind of set up a meeting and we'll talk about it. What is your, why, what is it, who are you going to serve? Um, you know, and then the revenue model, how you're going to make money, that's definitely a, a component in there and, and how you're going to sustain this. Um, but it's, it's interesting when you see someone like a student come into this entrepreneurship tunnel, um, they really have a different, uh, they really don't know what this means. And that's where you kind of lay it out for them and you can kind of give them steps to go down. And then you could see that either they're going to grab onto it or they're going to kind of fade out for a little bit. But I think one of the things that I, I, I've, I've loved seeing about what Frank has been doing with his students is the exposure. So he'll have these events where they'll do the big idea pitch, something that he hosts every year where students um, come up on a stage and they give an idea out there, but he invites everybody in the campus into this event. That's cool. And now all of a sudden, everybody starts to be thinking about it. And we have a, we work for a chancellor who's also incredibly entrepreneurial because he does, you know, he is one of these proponents of if you can't find the job, maybe you can make the job and, and kind of go down that path. And, and, I've, and Frank works that really well. So I think like in, in that question that Pete had, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's almost, we, we do have a process, um, but it, it's almost individual. And that's where, that's where it also takes a lot of energy too, because you're always trying to have this conversation to understand this person, what can they bring to the table? And then really, I think going back to that other item, these, these entities that are appearing at these universities across the country are succeeding I think primarily because they're resource portals. And that's, I think, Frank, if you, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but get, helping people succeed is, is ultimately getting them tied to the right resources. And yeah. some, some places, it's not a direct connection. It's like a treasure hunt. You, uh, who do you go talk to? What do you go see? And everybody says they have this stuff, but then it may not be what you need. And, and that's where those conversations and the connections need to continue to be to build wherever you are, whether you're in Georgia, Pennsylvania, Florida, California, those connections are essential to success, I think. Yeah, my, my goal personally was to connect with as many people that have economic resources as possible. There are so many dollars out there, especially after the pandemic. So uh -huh. anybody listening to this out there that wants to start a business, 
ask your local chamber of commerce, start there, say, I want to start a business and there are stimulus dollars coming down. Now, every community really determines it's typically at the county level that they determine how these dollars get allocated. Some counties throughout the United States are saying, you know, we want to allocate this specifically to restaurants and hospitality. Uh, there's probably rules at the federal level that are determining this, but there's more dollars than ever if you want to start something. So yeah. this is your chance. To, like people all the time will come in. What kind of grants are there? There aren't any grants that doesn't exist. Right. So there, that that's something that doesn't really exist unless you are really specialized in an area that, you know, most people never go into. So um, but this is the exception, right? So, and these dollars typically have a shelf life associated with them. So if they're not used up by a certain point in time, they'll go back, they'll disappear. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, uh, organizations like counties and chambers of commerce and economic development firms are trying to figure out how to get those dollars into the hands of people that want to start businesses, ideally to grow jobs. So anything that, anytime you can say, we're going to tie jobs to this, that's a plus. That's hard to do for most startups, but um, if you can show that, then, then that's a plus. And Fred said one other thing, these portals, right? So if you're at an institution that has one of these portals and you help um, Pete do what he wants to do, and he happens to end up making $50 million, yes. where is he going to want to donate some of his money, right? So there really is kind of a, uh, a life cycle to this where the institution, yes. if they can help uh, foster businesses will probably win in the long run. And I'm not saying anybody's doing it for that reason, but it, it might be a positive byproduct, right? Absolutely. So it's an, it's an interesting model and we're seeing this pop up everywhere now. I want to add another layer of understanding. You talked about um, helping t uh, people understand or teach interpersonal communication styles. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know there's some great free resources people can use or teachers can use to help their students. Um, share that with us, please. Yeah. So that's, you know, I, so I do a lot of um, consulting and training at the corporate level, as I mentioned earlier, and there's, there's a handful of topics that are, that I just love to do. And, and so time management, project management, but interpersonal skills is typically the thing I like to do. And there's a lot. So see there, these are things like disc profiles. So many people out there probably have taken a disc profile. Uh, Myers-Briggs is another another one of those. And there's many of these tests out there right now. Um, th there's companies that I'm hearing of all the time that are new tests. Uh, there's a new, relatively new one called the big five personality traits. That's the one that's most scientifically backed these days. Um, but uh, probably the most popular is Myers-Briggs because you can find these free tests online and take them. And um, a lot of people in the social sciences realm are poo-pooing these tests and, or these results. And they're saying, well, you know, it's not based on enough science. It's not proven, but if you go back to Myers-Briggs, if you look at Myers-Briggs, it's, it's a fairly antiquated approach. Um, but, but Myers and Briggs were a mother daughter team that developed this test. It's been refined over the years, but basically they studied under Carl Jung, uh, and so if you know who that is, right, you know that that uh, that Carl, of course, is tied to Freud. Right. So this goes back to the foundations of psychology. So maybe it's you know, maybe it's not as scientifically driven as we would like. But I do know this. Uh, the Myers-Briggs uh, organization, uh, the DISC organization that creates that test, they're always studying aspects of personality. They're always refining these tests. Uh, one company that. I worked with at one point, they had 50 data scientists working on one of these tests. It wasn't either of these, but it, it just shows you how much effort there is to develop these, uh, these approaches. So what I find interesting about this is people are surprisingly not self-aware. They really don't know themselves well at all. It, it's mind blowing to me because I've been doing this for about 20 years teaching this topic. And uh, I use a, a program called social styles. So if you were to go out to Amazon and look up social styles, uh, you'd find a $20 book. It's a great, uh, it's a great inexpensive book. Um, you can find videos on YouTube. Um, and uh, Wilson learning is who put the book out in the 1980s. 
Uh, it hasn't changed a lot since the 1980s. But if you like this idea of a disc profile, social styles is just the disc profile without a test. A person can sit there and assess another person and basically determine their disc profile without a test because we all exhibit certain characteristics. And so I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what you're feeling. I can't know those things, but I can know this. I can know that if you uh, tend to talk with a certain speed, uh, if you talk faster, you're probably more inclined to be someone who's a driver or expressive. If you talk more slowly, you're an amicable or an amiable or an analytical. So these are characteristics, they're broad brush approaches, and they're not necessarily there to like pin anybody into a corner, but what they will do is they will help people a understand themselves better. Right. So if I know me better, I can communicate better with others. And then if they can know others better as well, we can solve communication problems. And so uh, I remember doing this with a company uh, a few years ago, three or four years ago, and I had the executives. So I put, we put a hundred of their managers through a program. And this is one of the things of, of about, it was, it was a one-year program. So we talked about 20 different topics with their managers, but the executives would, would go through the program before the managers. Mm -hmm. And so we bring the executives in we run them through the, the social styles uh, module. And uh, we, we go around the room and, and I can typically identify a style pretty quickly. Uh, especially when you're talking about executives, they have, they're, they're a little more animated than maybe mid-level managers. <laughs> and so we get to the CEO and, you know, we're going around the room and, and, you know, we're talking about the CEO style and he goes, you know, this is, this really defines me really well. I'm going to take this, I'm going to take the results of my test back and put it on my door. And when people <laughs> come to my door, I'm going to point to the test to show them how they need to communicate with me. <laughs> Frank, I, I love that so much. I wrote a whole yes. blog about how we should write um, manuals. We have manuals for everything, for our laptops, our phones. You know, why don't we have manuals for each other, especially in the classroom? <laughs> Can you imagine if I your love kids it. could say, hey, I, you're trying to teach me this, but let me tell you, I know that I will learn this better if you do it this way. Well, just take learning styles, right? So, you know, visual, audio and tactile, right? So that, that very basic methodology and everybody, you know, has a dominant and a recessive style there. You know, how many educators really ever stop and just stand back for a second and say, is this a visual learner? Is this an audio learner? Or is this a tactile learner? And right. maybe for this student, do I need to modify the approach a little bit? Like, I get that that's really tenuous and time consuming. Um, but when you try to think in those different styles and what the delivery methodology needs to be to those different styles, you can actually integrate all of those styles within a lesson, right? So uh, all of these personality aspects, if you think about them in terms of how do you develop your craft of teaching, you can really amp up what you, what you can do in terms of teaching people and, and understanding them better. So, you know, all these things, um, you know, they're valuable things. You, you can, so the, the downside, Aaron, I think to making it a manual is then people turn it into, well, you know, everything. And, and this is the knock on Myers-Briggs. So if you, you know, you come up with a certain style and then something happens that doesn't fit that style. People start melting down. Oh my God, why am I not acting like uh, an ENFJ, right? So I, I don't understand. <laughs> right. Because it's only a guide, right? It's not meant to be like all- Your mold, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that's the danger, right? We as humans, we want to, we tend to have chaos. And then what we do is we develop order and then we just go over the ledge into order and it's a little <laughs> too far. <laughs> and so balance, right? So, so that's, you know, I, I love those kinds of things. I think everybody should, I think everybody should do a disc profile and understand their dominant styles, their recessive styles. They should be able to look to others. When I'm hiring people, I do a very simple test. This is part of the, the social styles and it fits into disc. And so draw a line on a piece of paper and at one end of the paper, put tasks. So tasks, getting stuff done. At the other end of the paper, put the word people. And then on that line, on that spectrum, first of all, you, so you do it first, put an X where you think you're stronger, task or people. 
the immediate thing everybody wants to do is they go right to the middle of the page. So I make that <laughs> illegal. That is not allowed. <laughs> You're not allowed to go to the middle because nobody's in the middle. You either favor tasks or people. Now you have to think about it, right? So it takes time. Um, and you would be surprised. I have to spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about here's task orientation. Here's people <laughs> orientation. It's, it's interesting. Like people just never think they never really question themselves and say, what are my inclinations? Where do I lean? How am I doing this? What do I think about that? So that's why going through those sorts of assessments is valuable. It's not, you know, it's not all encompassing. It's all in, all inclusive, but it certainly will give you insight into mm -hmm. number one, me, and then number two, thinking about how to interact with others in better ways. 100%. I, I, 100%. Yeah. You know, and I really love that too. And real quick, I was going to say like one of the things, one of those exercises that goes on early, early on is that why, um, that great question, what is your why? But, you know, I hear and you say that Frank, and, I, and I've seen this firsthand. We won't go into details where, but the thing is, um, yeah, that understanding yourself is such a crucial thing. And it would be such a great thing to see happen in the K through 12 space. Yeah. Now, as they're developing, obviously it, it may get, it, it's going to ebb and flow. And then continuing on that exercise as they get to higher ed or wherever they may go, just knowing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, that's. It's interesting. And so when you look at Myers-Briggs and the big five, the one overlap that they do have is extroversion, right? So that's the one thing that's common between the two. So extroversion versus introversion. And, you know, a lot of times people aren't even sure where they fall there. And, you know, you can ask a person a few questions, you know, do you want to go to the party or not? You know, that's a pretty good <laughs> indication if they're an extra, extrovert or not, right? So just simple things. Um, and, and so, but a lot of people don't even know that, right? And that's pretty evident. But to your point about children, they've probably evolved, whether they're introverted or extroverted, probably by the time they're six, right? So very early on children, you know, is it a child who tends to stick to themselves or are they, you know, more often part of a group? Well, what could that do for bullying? If we understood this, someone who's a loner, right? Because they're maybe extremely introverted, maybe we could help them not be bullied. Right. So hmm. this is where understanding aspects of a personality have tremendous practical application, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it, it's a lot of knowledge, right? You have to work hard to kind of master that, that set of skills. I'm a fan of Gallup. I've done Gallup before and done the strength finder. Yes. I think, you know, if you understand what your strengths are, then even like I'll take the TPR crew, like there was a lot of thought put into who, you, other than we just kind of get along really well, which is nice, but what are different things that we could all bring to the table, right? Because yes. if, if it's not a strength of mine, I would love to work with a team where I've got other people that can fill in those strengths that I can't. So really, really good Absolutely. stuff. Really good stuff. You. Frank, you. I'm, you're so passionate about this. I'm curious, do you have a teacher, a coach or a mentor or someone um, growing up that kind of sparked this in you or? or it was me. <laughs> yeah, it was Fred Avery. That's right. Yes. Uh, He's just looking like, know, oh no. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not, you know, I, I think everybody has teachers that they remember. I mean, there's no one that I think back to where I'm like, this person definitively, you know, made me want to do this. There was one person, a mentor that, that I had who taught me social styles um, and, and Fred knows him, uh, Bill Shaka. So, you know, you know, Bill, so we got to get him on the show too. Yeah. Bill yeah. would be a great addition to the show. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and <laughs> you know, he's, <laughs> he'll be more entertaining than me. So I don't know if it's good or bad. <laughs> um, so, you know, he was very influential for me learning that. And, um, and so, you know, I think there are individuals that I've interacted with, but I'm kind of an oddity. Like I don't have a job. I really think of myself as doing all these different things. Um, and you know, I, if I had to do one thing, the same thing, 12 hours a day, I probably would just, you know, implode. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting, but I can't cite like one person that made me who I am and, and kind of, you know, turn me into this weird mix of entrepreneur, educator, and whatever risk manager and all this other crazy stuff that I do. So I wish I had a better answer for that, but I think that's a great answer. Okay, well, thank you. I think it's whoever I, I think I'll leave here and I'll say, Hey, I got one or two things. 
off of this. Right. And then, and mm-hmm. that becomes part of my repertoire. Right. So, absolutely. and so I think we're always kind of, you know, interacting and rubbing off on each other and picking things up from each other. And there's obviously some people, you know, that stand out more than others, but, but no one that's like, you know, a lot of the things I do mentors in my life would have said, that's kind of dumb, Frank. I don't know if you should be doing that. And, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't care. I did it anyway. So you I wish I had a better the, answer. Taking the risk. No, that was great. And you actually did a nice little segue to our, our next section is we always like to talk at the end about our takeaway from the conversation or something that sparked an idea or interest in us. So if you're okay, we're going to, the four of us go through it. And as our guests, we'll give you the kind of last word here. Um, great. Hmm. Who should I call on first? Let's uh, I'm staring at my shoes. (laughs) Ready, (laughs) Blee. All right. So I think I just like to kind of echo something that was said early on. And and it's a it's a little bit of a misunderstood thing, and that's the concept of minors. So it's really not so much a phrase that you said, but it was a concept. The minor, as far as I'm aware, and if if anybody wants wants to correct me, they can correct me or whatever, the minor doesn't cost extra money. And I always try to get my students to understand that it, the thing that it'll cost you is time. So usually at a public institution, anything above a full-time credit load is part of your bill. So if you want to do 12 credits or 22 credits, mm. you could do it. It's already part of your bill. Mm. And having a minor is such a wonderful thing because it does everything you were describing, Frank. It, it you know, it exposes you to another field. It, uh, it broadens your knowledge base, but it also separates you from the pack. And, and if there's ever a need for a, a college student to think about how they're going to mm-hmm. separate themselves from the other 40,000 people all graduating in May across the country, or, or more than that, um, that minor is that thing on a resume that starts to do that. But it also is part of something called that I talked about, and that was the concept of CS plus X, CS being computer science, X being whatever you want it to be. It could be nursing. It could be the mm-hmm. arts. It could be business. But those two together... What can that, what can your ex be? I think that's the big thing. Nice. That's awesome. How about you, Letitia? I love being around smart people. <laughs> well, when you find <laughs> Yeah, me too. I, 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 the I'm negativity, you know how I feel about the negativity. <laughs> Receive the compliment, sir. I will. <laughs> I got to keep up. them in line, Frank. Stay up. You got to stay on I it. I know. Me too. Me too. I know. Receive the compliment. So I absolutely love several things. I got a lot of notes here, but I love the physical word is critical. We just do not realize realize how important what we say and what we write, right, is. And so I I just love that you, that's going to stick with me because it is critical that we write it down, that we write the goals down. I love vision boards. You know, when folks do vision boards, I like to do words instead of really pictures, but yeah, the fi- the physical word is critical. Like so like thank that. you, sir, for like that, that wisdom. Very nice. How about you, Pete? Yeah, um, um I had the same thing. I, I live <laughs> off of lists, long-term lists, daily lists. It just keeps my head. <laughs> I'm a list. <laughs> it keeps my brain, my file cabinet clear. Um, so, uh, and it, it keeps me uh, aware of what's on the horizon. So I, I work off lists and write down that goal. So important. Know yourself. And uh, goal setting matters. Mm-hmm. So that's the, I, a lot of those things lit me up at the beginning. So um, thank you. Wonderful. And then it's my turn. So I've got two. My first one is I'm going to quote a uh, person, Prince, formerly known as Prince. <laughs> Party like it's 1999. Yes. There is something about that year because Matthew McConaughey, you brought up Fred, right? He Yeah at one of his big time goals, Frank, that's when you started to get the call to teach. And then I can't remember last week, Mello, our guest, he said something and it had to do with 1999. So I don't know mm. what is up with that year, but Prince was on to something. So Fair just well. wanted to share that out there. If the rest of you out there in TPR had something big in 1999, let us know. Let us, let us know. know. We're doing a little <laughs> research here. Um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> but Frank, um, the thing that I wrote down, we need depth and breadth of knowledge. Yes. Mm. that kind of went ding, 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 ding in my mind. I'm, you know, the Gallup thing said that I am someone that um, I'm very introspective. I love to read. I love to research. And that's so much uh, of me. Uh, but I also love to share and listen to what other people have to say. So I like that. We need depth and breadth of knowledge. 
Nice. Hey, Frank, it's your turn. Do you have anything, any last words or thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah. So just to kind of echo a few things that, that you folks uh, threw out there, um, you know, as far as the minor goes to kind of recircle back to what Fred was talking about there, um, just to, to clarify, because it is different at different institutions. So sure. he's, he's right. Public institutions, you probably can get a minor for free. So that really is an important point. Mm -hmm. You probably will have to pay per credit at private institutions. So sure. you should always ask, always ask. Um, but um, wherever you can find credits to fill in those things and get that minor, try to do that, folks, because it's really valuable. And just think about this. Let's say you have a uh, a business, let's say you're a business major and you have English as a minor, that's going to make you a really good blog writer, which is probably the most in-demand skill as we sit here today, right? There's few things, every company needs content. Mm -hmm. So blog writing, and that's by the way, an entrepreneurial endeavor to tie it back to the topic at hand. So you can be a freelance blog writer and make a ton of money. Uh, Fred and I had a student uh, a few years ago who is a blog writer and uh, he's got a company worth probably half a million dollars. I don't know. So, uh, and uh. that's only a few years <laughs> ago. So, um, so that's important, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, you know, to, to that point, um, uh, as far as Letitia, you said, you know, the physical word and writing it down and vision boards, you know, those are all critically important things. And then the very next step after that, do something right. Mm -hmm. So, the, where where goal setting gets a knock, where people don't like goal setting is people stop at the goal. Okay, mm -hmm. so you write the goal down, <laughs> now go do something, right? So that's the very next thing is have an action item. Uh, Pete, to your uh, thing about lists, you can never have too many lists. Sometimes I do uh, time management and I you know say to people, well, do you have a to-do list? Because that's the basic time management tool. No, because it'll just bring me down about how many things are on the list. I'm like, that stuff's there anyway. So you might as well put it down on paper. Uh, like, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Pete, are you familiar with uh, getting things done? Have you looked at that methodology? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, look up getting things done. I've recently yeah. adopted that, and it is an awesome methodology. There's a okay, lot of free cool. videos out there. Uh, so Thank that's uh, my takeaway on that. And then uh, anything you want to know out there at the world at large, Look it up on YouTube. It's the best school yes, out there, right? It's the best. PhD. All free. It's all free. So go find what you want to do and build that breadth of knowledge that way. And uh, then Aaron, to bring it back to your last point, um, we'll steal another Prince song. Let's go crazy. Let's go. <laughs> hey, nice. Yes. Everything's a side gig. Everything's, Everything's a, side a side gig. gig. Let's go crazy. Everything's a side gig. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. My So my motto for my blog, which is for teachers, is embrace the crazy, be a teacher. So that's a nice little. How ironic is that? There you go. I don't know that either. That's I love that. that. Crazy hey, mom. Frank, where can our listeners find you if they want to connect with you? Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty, you know, I, I embrace social media, but I'm really bad at social media. So I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, so my name is pretty fairly rare. There's a few Sorokaches out there. Uh, but if you look up Frank Sorokach, I'm the only Frank Sorokach out there. So uh, you could find me probably on LinkedIn, uh, well, definitely on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and um, uh, Instagram. That's a mess. I don't really do anything there. But, uh, <laughs> I have like an inactive profile. So, uh, you know, just probably LinkedIn because it's a professional circle and that would be probably the angle most people would be coming from. But um, awesome. You know, I'm open to connecting if anyone out there wants to. So thank you folks for having me today. It was really, really fun. It was a blast. Yeah, this, what a great this conversation. has been a really yeah, great conversation. This was awesome. Hey, Pete, what about hey. our TPR crew? Where they can they find us? Let's keep the conversation going. Our website, teacherpeprally.com, our Facebook group. Um, it, wherever you're listening to us, whatever platform, leave us a review. We would love to get some reviews on there. And then also call the new TPR hotline and let us know. What was the best thing about your 1999? Yeah, I would oh. like to know. Let us know. So it's 678. I wrote it down, Aaron. 439 TPR1. 678 439 TPR1. That's great. And then one more thing. Sorry, Frank. We've got a couple of great yeah. things happening here. We had a, a special guest, an author come on uh, for the disintegrating student. 
And so we got some comments and even some, some of you didn't want to put it in the public comments. We got some behind the scenes instant messaging on our Facebook page. That's okay. That's fine. Um, and so our winner is Travis Carlson. So we will reach out to you, get that address, and this will be coming to you in the mail. Excellent. Thanks again, awesome. Frank, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you for having you. me. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Frank. You, Frank.